Welcome back. Great scenes at the Sydney Cricket Ground on Saturday night after a record-breaking win. The Saints linking arms, going over to their supporters, and they had plenty of them. It was great being there, wasn't it? I tell you, Bruce, all those seats were filled about 20 minutes early. <laughs> Most of the Sydney people left fairly early, I can tell you. Stan, welcome. Thank you, Bruce. Uh, congratulations, firstly. 101 points, uh, not to be sneezed at. I mean, you've got this incredible record now in Sydney. Did you pinch yourself halfway through the game and think to yourself, this is too good to be true? I don't, know if I, I don't know if they were the thoughts that come through, but I was of the opinion that they were going to come back. And uh, probably it was role playing within my mind if they come back, who, who will be the blokes will turn it for and what will be my counter moves? And yeah. I guess I was waiting for that all night. Did, sorry, I was going to say, because yeah. Coast coming back the night before, did that, did that sort of well, freshen it certain, Well, it certainly went through my mind, and I was just hoping that my players weren't thinking that way. <laughs> Stan, what does a coach say to his players when, you, when the, his team's 15 goals up three-quarter time? I mean, do you have to sort of set new targets for them, or how do you kid them into sort of... No, we don't have to set new targets or kid them. I mean, look, you, you would see that we have a pretty standard procedure in our guys going to groups, and, and they've got set things that they work on religiously work in, work out with a member of the match committee and they come in and they just assess those and uh, and that really becomes the key because I think what we're trying to do is is stop the emotion that can be either negative or positive influencing what you need to do and if we want to pride ourselves on being a good side we've got to become consistent and that's not just week in week mm, out it's, mm. it is quarter by quarter mm. stuff. Stand with a margin like that do you get a view of you guys who just so over the top good or the other mob were just very bad. I mean, do you sort of get a feeling of either which of those? Or I can tell you the most uh, the, the, the most emotion or feeling that I had like that was, God, we were like this when we played Essendon in round two. Mm. Yeah. That's really what yeah. kept coming back to me. And, and yeah. From that stand, and you too, Lee, how does a coach, I wonder how Rodney Ede reacted. I mean, how do you react when you had this humiliating loss? Mm. This loss that's yeah. Inexplicable home. almost. At home, yeah. too. I reckon it's like the Swans getting beaten in Sydney. Like that. You got beaten by S and the MCG. Yeah. Yeah. I guess Waverley's a bit... But this, if it's like the suburban ground, like Collingwood with Fremantle at, at yeah. uh, Victoria Park or yeah. Sydney in Sydney, I, I, I think that the demolition on your home turf stings even more, I suspect. Well, I suppose it does, but I, I mean, I can't speak on behalf mm. of Rodney, but mm. I know that uh, our reaction was that we had a meeting and, and it's probably five minutes into that meeting we decided not to have the meeting. After the bombers. Yeah, after the yep. bombers because we said it was just too too bad, it was too uncharacteristic, nothing will be learned, nothing positive can come out of it. Now let's just talk about what we need to yeah. do. Mm. Do you have yeah. strategies after the match when you have a big win? I noticed that Nicky Wimmer had a strategy with you on Saturday night. <laughs> oh, yeah. You tried to get away, Stan, because you knew you were going to get wet. Uh, the water you, here. Yeah, <laughs> you watch this, everybody. Stan, uh, look, Nicky's got you. Look, I can tell you, I, I came in there and I, I was pretty excited and I wanted to be part of the guys and then I saw Harvey with water and I thought, gosh, we've got a few functions to go to. We're in the state. I haven't bought another change of clothes. I can't stand it. And as I'm going out, the windmaster said, I've got you. <laughs> do, you, do, you do you read Patrick Smith? No, I haven't read Patrick Smith. He said you I'm did sorry. a very good job as a pogo suit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, if, I, I would have loved to have got out of it, I'll tell you that much. Now, Stan, that's seven from seven in the 90s at the SCG for St Kilda. And I heard you on radio yesterday say that you told your players in the lead-up there were certain no-go areas at the SCG. Tell us a bit about where they might be. Did I open my mouth on that? You did, actually, I? yeah. Um, Someone's always listening, Stan. King's Cross. Well, I think, it, the, <laughs> I think the obvious one uh, that I'm sure you'd all know is that when you bring the ball into the forward line, it's a pretty standard procedure with, with most clubs to go to, to an area in front of the goals and things like that. But the, uh, in my opinion, the, the, uh, the Sydney boys, their backs will actually play quite well off their, their opponents and, and they will come in to crowd that gap. And you've got to avoid the temptation of doing what you do at other grounds and mm -hmm. don't do it at Sydney. And, and so it was very important that we honoured the loose man and we, and we even in the heat of, uh, of battle, that we were strong enough to look for targets out the side of our mm -hmm. eyes rather than just blast mm -hmm. away because mm -hmm. that's where they'll go. And not only do, do they win the ball there, but with the likes of Ruse and even an O'Loughlin coming down and that, they will get numbers there and they'll bring it out and they'll hurt you because if you've come in this side and you go to the spot, uh, that we'd all like to go to. I'll just come and hurt you and come back the other way and there's such a terrific side of bringing it out. So we just had to sort of discipline ourselves and, and that became a no-go area. Look, we've looked at um, the top seven clubs in their last 30 matches and some of them go back. It depends on how many finals they played last year. Now, admittedly, we've done this and it does bring you up in a very good light because when you made started to make your run last year, West Coast have won 15 of their last 30. In fact, their last three, North Melbourne 18. This is from about round four, five or six last year. Geelong, Sydney the same. 
The Bulldogs 20, the Crows who won four finals, and look at the Saints, 23. So for a year and a half, really, on those figures, you've been quite clearly the most consistent and the best side in the competition. Yeah, look, uh, if you'd taken the 30 before, you'd know the reason why it means a fair <laughs> bit to us. I mean, that, and I, I, you know, I, I say that flippantly, but but it, uh, it's something that we've we've eaten humble pie for so long. We we don't want to be just Johnny come ladies and up and then just fade away. Stan, you mentioned how to play the SCG in a perverse way with Lowy not being available and therefore not having the, the main marking target up there. Did it make it in some ways easier just to go to the best target rather than the predetermined one they normally go to? Yeah, we, we wouldn't have played Lowy at centre half forward if he'd played Lee um, for, for that reason. Um, but yeah, I mean, it, you, we, we just had to play a different brand of footy. Mm, mm. Everett's ruck work, I mean, Stafford just didn't look right, taking nothing away from Everett, and Sirikovsky also did a good work. But Lee, some of these tap outs were absolutely perfection, weren't they? I've got to say, I've always thought uh, ruck hit outs is probably the most useless stat in football, unless they <laughs> go somewhere. That's spoken like a little guy, I <laughs> yeah. suppose, Stan. But I thought uh, Everett's ability to give the ball to his ground level players in the centre square and enable them to make. Have a look at this little flip over the back, these clear clearances was the one of the more dominating palming exhibitions I've seen from uh, from a ruckman. I thought he was just uh, fantastic. And he sort of, I guess we've spoken about putting himself on the line, he's dyed his hair, blitzed and all that kind of stuff, but he, he it seems to relish it. Whatever, if, if it's putting more pressure on himself, he's relishing it and his performance yeah, look, is increasing. He, he's one of those uh, unique characters yeah. from, from that point of view. I mean, uh, in, you know, I've stated this to him many times, a lot of little things he does and that, that pr probably as a coach and, and you try and look at the overall team that you'd you just wouldn't like your players to be doing, but he does those things because he has the ability to, to still retain his focus on what's required. So, but it's a credit to him and, and our ruck coach. I mean, uh, Peter Keenan's work with him, and I mean they come down at about three o'clock during the day and, and, mm. and just work on specific things, and then he calls the shots with our on balls. And it, it's actually an interesting thing. We, we've changed a little bit of the culture there. That you know we probably didn't have great ruckman and, and and the setups and everything used to be called by by our ground level players mm. and now Peter's the man who calls mm. the shots. I was interested particularly because Robert Robert Harvey so often his target at ground level that John Stevens, who was the who was Harvey's tag, was starting outside the centre square. Let's have a look at this. We've got Stevens there number twenty on the wing. Harvey of course in the centre square. Now Stevens is going to pick him up once the bounce is completed, but I was Pretty surprised, in fact, for all the games Stevens come from the wing, why he didn't run from the back of the centre square, because this kind of play where that Harvey running forward through the front of the centre square, do you reckon it must have happened six or eight times? And, I, and you know, I'd, hard for you to say that, I, I guess, Stan, but it just seemed to me, Graham Corns and Bruce, we were doing the commentary, mm. and it yeah. just seemed like it was a... Very made it even more difficult for Stevens to get his within arm's length of Harvey. Well, Rob, I mean, well, Robert was hot, and uh, you know, and we said, you know, Spider was winning the tap. So, to be quite honest, my concern was who was running out of the square, mm. um, because you know, with Stevens going and coming mm. off the wing, my concern, and you can imagine, who was dropping back, and were my backmen getting sucked in and just and mm. losing the sight of him. So, I mean, that was that was more of our concern, and. Uh, you know, I suppose it was, uh, it's probably because of that, we, it wasn't as great an appreciation of the work Harvey and those blokes were mm. doing until we were well into the game. Mm. Stan, fair to say, is it that uh, Robert Harvey's first half this year has been better than his first half in the Brownlow year? Um, yes, uh, and that's allowing for the fact that uh, he, he started a little bit slow and then he, he had the broken ribs mm. and, uh, and had those problems. But... Um, I, I think he's playing better football by far. I mean, I, I think his use of the ball um, mm. is, is much mm. better uh, than last year. And uh, I, and actually, even from the way we measured, I mean, uh, his defensive aspect of his game and, and other little things are, are, are much better than he was doing previously. You spoke a moment ago about Peter Everett doing maybe a couple of things that you think maybe aren't absolutely right. Barry Hall and Peter had a bit of fun late in the game where they showed the ball to the opposition. It was a bit cheeky. I mean, how do, how do you feel about that? Oh, look, I'm not a big fan of that. Um, I mean, uh, our season goes longer than one, uh, than, than one week. And uh, I'm a bit of a believer that uh, from two things. Firstly, you, um, you don't want to give ammunition, but also at this level, I, I like to think that you re respect your opposition. Mm. And continue, uh, continue to see Barry Hall at centre-half back. It was his first go at senior level. And yeah, look, we've been we've been sort of toying with the idea for a while, mm. um, and I suppose the thing that uh, that led us to play him there was that, that the Swans have a tall forward line and make up, and we we felt that Daryl could do pretty well on Tony, and 
and uh, that just gave us the opportunity to slip him in there and uh, certainly he played very very well for us. Um, I think he's got a bit to go in terms of, uh, of, of playing on the smarter, smarter people, he'll learn that. But we were pleased with, his, uh, with the fact that he was able to pick up possessions and gave us some good attack and run out of the back line. And Peter Everett with twirling the ball, is that just not, can you categorise that as flair and, and that that's his personality and he's expressing himself, it, playing the football he's playing? I mean the previous week he saluted the umpire, he just seems to be able to do a couple of those things and not lose his focus. I think there's a fine line, I mean that's, that's what I'm getting at. If it gets to the stage where it, be, it becomes uh, something uh, that people expect of you and you start to do it and play up, because um, I mean... <laughs> We coaches, I mean, we're we're a pretty demanding lot, and sometimes we go over and the top. And, and I understand that, but it's not so much the conservatives. My, my fact is, while you're spinning the ball, what if you missed the bloke who was free mm. and you could have kicked it to him? I mean, that's that's the sort of thing that we think about, and uh, and I, you know, so I mean, you know, I, I don't want to discourage uh, my players out there doing things if they, they're enjoying it. But again, we've got to understand it is a team game, and, and we're looking to do the maximum in that area. Speaking of Everett, he was. Uh a weekly winner in the Norwich Rising Star Award in 1993. Now, we have a facts uh, situation every week, AAPT Smart Chat, Stan, and people send us in all sorts of things, and the, the, most of them are fascinating, actually. And Peter K. Mikor has sent uh, to us a photograph of the Rising Stars in 1993, Everett being one of this group. And when we go through them, it is, this was an absolutely vintage year. You can see at the back you've got Colbert, Chapman, Fletcher, Neats, and uh, just down in front of them, Rashuto and Buckley. This group, uh, Everett's two from the left at the back with Grigic, Richardson, Chase Rocker. <laughs> yeah, he has a look at the spider. Two from the back at the left, and Matthew Richardson, Grigic, and and, uh, and Rocker with himself. Look, Scotty West surrounded by uh, uh, Honor yeah, and, uh, and, and Joe yeah, And Joe Masidi. Yeah. Right, yeah. I mean, we're talking about stellar players. Shane Crawford in the centre Glenn there. Archer. Glenn Archer. And Dan then Cowley. And Cow, mm. young Cow. I say young, young yeah. yeah. Buckley was shoot over Mercury. Handy up though. This is all, all from 1993. What the, was this Chinese year of the what? We oh. <laughs> better find out. Chinese year of the very good players. <laughs> Chinese year of the very good players. Yeah. So, yeah. Fair so crop, thank you for all of that. Yeah. A very, very fair club. Just quickly, Aussie Jones. Um, Mike wrote an article, uh, what well, might have been a week ago or two no, weeks. No, Mike and Sam wrote the okay, article two together. Weeks. No, I, I, I rang the coach and asked the question. Seriously, uh, yeah. and you expressed some views in that article that Aussie had a bit of grow, maybe growing up to do, maturing to do, that he had to get his head back and had to concentrate. I mean, how's... I well, let, me, let me say no. a couple of things. No, I, I didn't, I didn't no. say that at all. Okay. What, what I said emphatically was that the boy who is, has become a great player against a lot of adversity because of a lot of hard work. He's got terrific natural talent, yep. but he's worked very, very hard. And, and, and if you're at the club, you have seen how hard he worked on and off the track. And as a result, uh, all Australian player, fantastic mm. final series and an outstanding prospect. With that went a lot of the trappings, the recognition and, and the opportunities to go into areas like media, which I'm absolutely thrilled for him. And I don't ask him to cut back in any way. But what I said was that it was, I had a concern that he well wasn't doing the things that made mm. him a good footballer. His intensity at training that were dropped off. And what he had to do was come back and knuckle down and do those things. Because if his footy dropped away, so would all the but other why things. why through that forum, Stan? Why through the forum of a newspaper? Because of the fact that uh, we'd spoken to him about that. Um, and we just wanted him to understand that this was part of the deal. And, and, and we wanted to acknowledge it. And we wanted to bring it to his attention. Um, in in the best possible way. So uh, I mean, it was a it was something we thought that was worthwhile doing, because I mean he's an outstanding talent. What I can't have is a situation where he drops away completely and we've got to resurrect him. He's not playing great football at the moment, mm. but he's playing pretty good. So did it work? Oh look, he he, he really is knuckling down. And mm. uh, no I bad mean, blood. No, none at all. I mean, look. Uh, having said, you know, the fact that what people might understand is that the relationship we've got it amongst myself and the players is that he knew the article was going to come in, the players all knew, so I mean this was nothing done behind anybody's back in any way, so mm. there's not a problem. Sure it's hurt him, I mean sure it's stung him and I understand that, but I just have the belief that down the track he'll be better for it mm. and he'll understand. Fair enough.